you're all here to listen to a great presentation by our guest. Um, this, I would like to you, introduce you to Roger Gay. He was inspired early in <coughs> life by personal experiences that drew him to the game warden profession. He's also a certified canine handler, which was another passion of his, and the great outdoors. Roger has had a career that has spanned over 25 years, and he has helped to establish canine units as a staple in game warden service. In his book, A Good Man with a Dog, and I hope you all will come up and peruse that and purchase a copy, he takes readers on a patient, watchful world into the world of a game warden, chasing poachers, protecting pristine wildlife, <coughs> and sometimes with CSI-like reconstruction of deer and moose poaching scenes. Sadly, he has also had to have pulled more than 200 bodies out of the main woods. Between lost <coughs> hunters, hikers, estimating that over the years you've done this work that helps to not only rescue but also recover. Um, people that have found themselves in trouble. He's fr frequent, his frequent companions have been canines, and they help to detect weapons, ejected shells, hidden fish, and missing persons. And we have had the uh, main canine search and rescue team here. Sure. So we've learned how amazing these dogs are in the training. And so please welcome Roger to Berwick Library. Thank you. Um, I'll kind of start a little bit about my journey, where I start, where I come from. I grew up in the town of Jackman, Maine. Anybody know where Jackman is? Yes. The end of the road? Cross, go by Jackman, and you're in Quebec. And, uh, so that's where I grew up. I, my dad, I come from a family of guides, um, and uh, so I've always been in the woods. My dad, I started going in the woods when I, was, I could fit in a pack bass my dad, so that's how long I went. That lady over there who's my right hand, is uh, that's my wife Jolene. She, she was the girl next door. And I'm here to tell you, when you grew up in Jackman and you see a pretty girl next door, you don't let them get away. <laughs> Because there aren't very many, I'm just saying. So I never let her escape. We've been married for 40 years, and uh, you know it's been, it's been uh, very challenging for her as my spouse and all the things that we've gone through and everything, but uh, God bless her. The second most patient woman in the world that I dealt with in, in this book was Kate Flora, my co-writer. She grew up in the Belfast area, and kind of how the book got started was... Um, she worked on several cases. She wrote books on two cases that I was heavily involved with. One was Finding Amy, which was about a young girl that disappeared in the Old Port in Portland. And the other case was uh, a book that she wrote called Death Dealer, which was about a case in the Miramichi in New Brunswick that we actually went up and helped the officers solve the case up there. So, so in, in contacting, she was writing these books. We got talking and and one thing led to another and we decided to write a book so here we are today um, so I you know she gets a lot of credit I told the stories and she able was able to put it into words and and we worked together but one of the first missions that that when we sat down and talked about how we're gonna write this book she handed me a little tape recorder and she said you know when you think of a story just talk into the thing. Well, I can tell you from 25 years of law enforcement experience, nothing good ever, ever comes from talking into one of those machines, right? <laughs> so about a month or two later, she calls me and she goes, so how many stories you got? I go, zero. <laughs> I haven't even put the batteries in it yet, Kate. <laughs> I go, you got to come up, jump in the truck, and we'll drive around. And if you want to hold the tape recorder, just don't let me see it. And we'll drive around. And we'll talk. Well, it was October. And you don't drive around that country up north in October without a shotgun, right? So, so if you listen to the recordings, you'll hear us talk, and all of a sudden go, oh, there's a bird, there's a bird. And you hear, pow! 
and that's my wife shooting the bird and coming back. So it was a different way to start a book, but it worked. It worked very well. It took us about four years to get it all together because how you take 25 years and format it into something that, that makes sense. Um, so, so I have to give her a lot of credit because at the end of it, she knew my personal life as good as I did. And sometimes she'd correct me. <laughs> so, so it was, we spent a lot of time working on it and, and uh, you know, she did, she did the lion's share of the work. So, but kind of how my journey began in warden service is, is uh, I was a very young age. I was about the age of these two young fellows right here. And I saw a warden get out of his truck and check me and, and my dad, we were out hunting and I just was, you know, that badge just caught my eye. I got gold fever, but it wasn't for gold, it was for the badge. And I just fell in love with it. And as I grew up, I never lost that, that want to be a, a game warden. And as I, as I learned more and more about it, um, you know, it, it became more important to me. And then I, I lost my dad in a drowning accident when I was about 18. And uh, the wardens were involved with recovering his body. And, uh, and that kind of solidified it because I knew from that experience how important it was to the people of the state of Maine to be able to bring that closure. And uh, so that's kind of what brought me around to this, to this book. Now, you know, one of the things that, that you know, and, and the dog part of it kind of came a little bit later. Um, but I'll share with you a little bit about the day before my first day of work. I was in Princeton, Maine. Anybody been to Princeton? There's a few people that like to kill things there. And the first night we moved into the house, right, about 15 trucks turned in my driveway to see what I was driving for vehicles. Imagine that. Nobody stopped to bring me a plate of food or anything. They just wanted to see what my vehicles were. And it was kind of a a new experience in that when you walked into stores, everybody stopped talking because you were the new guy and they didn't know who know you and stuff. So, so my the night before I actually started work, I get this phone call from a very distraught lady down the road, and she says, "I have this raccoon. I need help. I need help. I got this raccoon. It won't let me out of the house." And, and she, you know, this kind of went on for a little bit. Of course, I had just got out of the academy. 20 years of running, 25 weeks of running you know, miles every day, and I was in the best shape, and it was kind of like, oh, man, <laughs> right? I had this all going, right? I'll save you. This little raccoon, we'll take care of that. So I hop in my truck, drive into her yard. I roll in, and there's her porch, her lights on. I take about three steps away from this truck, and this Godzilla comes flying out from under the porch and it's gnashing at me and I'm running for all I can. I bail back in the truck, slam the door and it's jumping on the door. I went, holy cow! And she's hanging out the window. That's the one! That's the one! Right? And I'm going, holy cow, what did I get myself into here? I'm thinking, this is not good. So I signal, I said, go back in the house. And I had my tr trusty little 22, and I kind of moved the vehicle a little bit, and I dispatched him. He obviously was very sick and angry, <laughs> and he wanted a piece of me. So we took care of it, and she, goes, she came out after, and she goes, I don't know what his problem was. I go, me neither, but don't call me again, okay? <laughs> we're good, we're good. So that was how my career began, and it was a wild ride from beginning to end. Um, so I started in the Princeton Patrol, and, and one of the areas that I had was Grand Lake Stream. That was in my patrol area, and, and West Grand Lake. And, if you've ever been there, there's a little post office in Grand Lake, and there's kind of a bench where all the old farts sit and watch the world and comment on the world's happenings. Well, I'm the new warden, right? Bright and shiny. I get this big boat. I back it in. First thing I do is leave the plug out of the boat. <laughs> so now I'm scrambling, trying to deal with that. And all these, they're sitting on the benches just watching me, right? They're getting a the real charge out of it. So I'm sitting there, and I'm trying to, you know, make up for my error. So I'm kind of frantically running around. Well, they had those, those snaps that unhook your boat. Well, I slipped, and it let go out of my hand, and it snapped my thumb. And I couldn't say any bad words. 
I really didn't want to dance around. So I just kind of slid into my truck for a minute and just <laughs> pretended I had to talk on the radio, shut all the doors and whimpered for a little bit. My thumb was literally blue, black and blue. So, so and, and you know, that was the beginning. Well, as I was, you know, Grand Lake stream, the, the salmon fishing and the trout fishing there in that stream is, is you know, world class and I'll never forget it. You know, you've been in the academy for all these weeks and you finally get let out of the cage, right? So I'm sitting in the bushes and, and I'm watching and I look and there's a line there that you can't fish above the line because there's a fishway and the fish congregate there and, and it's cheating. So I'm sitting there and I'm watching and this guy's casting right in the, right in the fishway. And, and I'm sta I came out of the woods right behind him after I watched him and two guys were fishing on the other side of the stream and I see one of them go like this to his buddy and he points up and he, so they saw me but the guy doing the crime was not, didn't see me. And I walk down over the bank, I go, how's it going today? And he jumps, I scare him so bad he throws his $400 fly rod in the air and it goes down the stream and <laughs> we ran down to catch it. And, that was my first case, and it was pretty fun. And you never forget that when it's, you know. So, so that was my beginnings. In in Princeton, you know, it was, I I had the Passamaquoddy Reservation in my patrol, and I was very fortunate that one of the officers that was with me in training was a Passamaquoddy, uh, and he was a Passamaquoddy warden, and um, it really helped. To understand their culture and understand how things worked in, in their world because it literally was a different society within the, and uh, so it worked out really really well for me and uh, uh, but I remember one of the first the first fall that I was working there um, you know I, I ended up getting caught in the field with a vehicle that was night hunting and they turned and came back to, to shoot a deer, or what they thought was a deer. And I ended up getting caught right in the middle because I was, uh, I was um, moving things. <laughs> and and uh, when the vehicle came back, I ran, and I fell in the hole, and I dislocated my shoulder. I actually broke a mag light. That's how far, hard I hit it. If you know how hard a mag light is, <laughs> I broke it. And I'm laying in this hole in this car. I got the spotlight spotting me all over, and I'm covering up everything that's shiny because I don't want them to mistake me for a deer. And uh, so I'm laying there, and, and uh, finally they leave. And my partner comes and gets me and we get in the truck. We had to drive. I was way up in Danforth and we had to drive the callus to the hospital. I'm going all the way with it. And of course the road is complete instruction, all of that, <laughs> all the way. So I get, he gets me to the hospital and all's good. And they knock me out and they pop it back. And, and so he brings me home. By this time I'd, I'd been given some, some feel good stuff, right? <laughs> so. He gets me in the house and he points me towards the bedroom, kind of gives me a little shove, and he goes, what's it feel like to be shot anyway? And my wife, that's what she hears, right? And I come in high as a kite, I spin around, flop on the bed, and I'm out cold. She has no idea what just happened, right? <laughs> Not good. She didn't see any, oops, sorry, any humor in that at all, you know? So, yeah, it's things you learn. <laughs> But we got him back, so. But, uh, so as my, after I'd been in Princeton for a few years, I transferred to the Greenville Patrol. My family, like I said, grew up in Jackman, and I wanted to be close to home, but not so close that I was chasing the kids I grew up in school with. So we made a deal. Don't touch the East Shore of Moosehead, and you'll be just fine. <laughs> so, so uh, we went to. I ended up in the Greenville. I had the east side of Moosehead, which if there's a zillion back mountain ponds in there, fly fishing, beautiful, beautiful fly fishing country, which is absolutely what I loved. And um, so, so that's where I, you know I, I began. And this is what would happen. I'd hike up some of these trails to get to the ponds. And I'd meet somebody in the trail coming out with a rod and their eyes would get about this big and they would turn and go, Game Morton's over here! <laughs> to his buddies sneaking up the trail with the load of fish, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden, fish learned how to fly. 
<laughs> Dead fish learned how to fly. They would go flying through the trees. And if you've ever tried to find brook trout that have rolled in the leaves, they're impossible to find. They're very hard. So I said, I got to do something. I got to come up with something better. So I decided I'd train my dog, Reba. She was a little chocolate lab pup. So I'm going to train her to find fish. Well, initially when I started, I was thinking of that scenario, but it progressed to being able to find fish in, in under snow, under in vehicles, and so forth. So some of the unique places that you find fish sometimes was my best one was inside a sleeping bag. It was frozen solid inside a sleeping bag. I don't know how it swam up inside there, but <laughs> neither did the owner of the sleeping bag. <laughs> and, uh, but as it progressed, I started working the dogs, and, and w I noticed this phenomenon of, you know the game, you're getting hot, 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 hotter, right? Well, when my dog would be running around, all of a sudden it would lock in on fish buried in the snow on Moosehead Lake. And, and the dog would start going over and their tail would start wagging. Everybody in the party started to stare at the sky behind them. <laughs> Nobody could handle looking to see what the dog was about to do. It was the great finale. Come on, guys, you got to watch it. But no, they were busy staring at the sky, right? And uh, so, so it was like, you know, that's what, how it started, right? And then this was a really good tool. Well, one night... We checked some, it was, the fishing was phenomenal in this area. We were up in that bee pond country up through there. And, and uh, so we get there and everybody was coming out their limits. It was, the, it was peak fishing time. Everything was perfect. And this one vehicle comes along, a couple of young fellows, they were in their late teens, come out and, and they said, no, we don't have any fish, which was kind of odd because they had all the right equipment and so forth. So we chit chat a little bit. Well, one of the young fellows steps out and he's showing me his license. And my dog is sitting right beside me patiently, right? And I'm talking, checking with him and stuff. I say, you sure you didn't catch anything? And finally, my, my little lab can't take it anymore, right? She just bails into the truck, pulls this big bag of trout from under the seat, flops it right at the guy's feet. <laughs> and he looks at me and he goes, we've been set up. <laughs> Somebody put those there. And I said, oh my, I said, this is very unfortunate. I said, we're going to have to seize the vehicle. This huge investigation is going to have to take place. We're going to tie this truck up for months. He goes, my dad needs that truck to go to work in the morning. I go, you have a problem. He goes, they're all ours. They're all ours. He fessed up real quick. But, uh, you know, by utilizing canines, we could do things and, and find things that we never could before. And, and prior to that, we were, we, the warden service had some canines, but we didn't fine tune them for what game wardens needed to that degree. So, so and that's kind of how this whole thing began. And uh, I trained them. One of the things that, that we trained them in, obviously we do a lot of search and rescue. I trained my dog to track. Now I had, I had kids about these kids' age at the time. And I'd hand them a book that they were reading. I said, all right, you go up this trail and down this road and over here. And in an hour or two, I'll come get you. I'll come find you with the dog, right? And that was pretty good till they got to be about 13. <laughs> and then we had to negotiate with treats. But we, they did it. Well, one of the things I inadvertently, without realizing I trained, is they would jump on a bike and pedal to somewhere. And then they'd leave their bike. And I'd start the dog at the bike to track where they went and hid. Well, inadvertently, without realizing, I trained my dog to track people on bicycles. And this came into play in a, in a deer case where the guy, this guy ran off. He saw us and jumped on a wheeler and took off and, and uh, disappeared. He obviously had deer, you know, he had the illegal deer with him and and so forth. So he comes back and, and it was, you know, the ground was frozen. You couldn't see tracks that very well. So I dig my dog out. I said, go get him. And she took off and she tracked. And we ended up at this big pine top. And underneath it, she goes, her tail's just a wagon. And sure enough, there's all, this, all the deer meat hidden right there. He was not impressed, I just got to say. <laughs> but uh, so, so, you know, and then we realized how great a tool. And, and one of the big big things that, that, you know, the dog was involved with was recovering shell casings from crime scenes. If you've ever 
had a 300 acre clear cut with a dead moose in it and you're looking for the little piece of brass that they left behind, it's a very daunting task. And with a metal detector, you'll be there for a month. With a dog, if I can get, get the dog within the, the size of this room of that shell casing, the dog will find it. And uh, we were able to put together tremendous cases. And, um, and, you know, pretty much in the fall, particularly moose season, I was, on, I was all over the state in the northern part solving moose cases. That was my, I did a lot of that. And uh, so, you know, and, and, and in her career, she helped solve over $300,000 worth of fish and wildlife convictions. One little brown dog with a waggly tail. And uh, so she was phenomenal. And I had her son as well. I trained her son up. And he was my truck locator beacon because if I left with mom, he would be so upset that I could hear where my truck was miles away because he would howl and cry. And I always knew how to get home when I had him with me. Eventually it switched as she got older and he became my lead. And uh, well, one of the things that, that kind of happened through this process was um, we had a missing hunter in the Ashland area in late November and uh, a huge search. I wasn't involved with the original search. I was away, but uh, um, the search had to be suspended after the snow got so deep it wasn't, you know, they'd search for almost two weeks and with, to no avail. So, and then the snow got so deep. So, so I was assigned to resume the search for, for the victim's body in the spring, and I worked through the winter to train my dog to find human remains. And, um, well, prior just prior to the snow melting in Ashland, which is like July-ish, <laughs> I was requested to go assist state police on a case where they had information of a, of a homicide victim being buried off the interstate near the Lincoln area. And uh, they had been searching for four or five days. They'd, they threw everything they had at it, but they just didn't come up with anything. So I went up with my dog and and uh, we met with the detectives, kind of got a gist of how everything was, how it all happened and so forth. And uh, I had, I, the dog found the gravesite within 15 minutes. And, uh, and when it was found, um, initially, the, the detectives kind of dug in the area that, that I pointed to and they kind of didn't find anything. And, uh, and I knew when my dog hit on that, that what she was telling me was right. And, uh, so I just I stayed there and I kept working. They had kind of moved off, and uh, and finally she just laid down in this one spot and poked, and it was under the leaves was a bone, a human bone, and it was it was her arm bone, and she'd broken her arm as a child, and you could see the break, which kicked everything into high gear. So from that point on, I took a whole different trajectory than most game wardens walk on. So. I was in heavily involved with a lot of homicide cases all over. And when I say all over, I've been to the Caribbean, I've been to Panama, I've been a lot of places. So um, I got just a quick shot of Panama. A, don't worry about the snakes, it's the spiders. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> so, but, uh, so as once I got in, you know, training the dogs, we started training all of our dogs because one of the things that we ran into in search and rescue was a lot of times we would be involved with searches and the victims were already deceased. And in a case like that, what would happen is the dogs sometimes, if they weren't trained properly, they would actively avoid deceased victims because it creeped them out just as bad as it does all of us, right? And they would avoid. So once we had GPS technology, we could actually see what, how the dogs were reacting and what was going on. So we really instilled that into our dog training, part of the cadaver work, so that the dogs weren't in that fearful state. And it really had a huge impact on our finds and so forth. So it was, it was, it was very, very uh, productive. So. And, and, you know, when you're thinking at the power of a dog's nose, the oldest grave sites that I've been able to identify with my dog is early 1800s. And, and those early, early, those old ones like that, they don't find it at where it is. They find it by the vegetation growing around it. 
and uh, it's very, it's, you know, it blows your mind when you see them doing it. And um, so uh, sometimes you're working, looking for something, and the dogs will actually give you an alert, but it's not what you're looking for. It's not the vintage of what you're looking for, but you can't not reward them because if they don't get their ball, they're going to give you a hard time <laughs> the rest of the day, right? So... I'll talk a little bit about some of the search and rescue. You know, one of the most challenging things for a dog person, a dog handler, um, is searching for lost children, right? What's, what's a higher stress than that, right? You, every time you walk into that environment of a missing child, you have a lot more questions than you have answers. You know, there's a lot of things. And case in point, I had a missing three-year-old in the Hodgson area, and, uh, and, and uh, so, I get to the scene, um, mom worked days, dad worked nights, and they kind of have coffee together in the morning, and a little fellow was running around on the tricycle, he had one of those big wheels, remember the big wheel plastic job? I had one, it was cool. And uh, so, he was last seen on that, and they turned around, and he was gone. Gone. Obviously, they searched all around, they were... And the neighbor comes over and says, yeah, I saw a sow with two cubs. She probably ate them. Just what the family wanted to hear, right? <laughs> so I got rid of him quick. So, so anyway, I got the dog. So I get, a, I get the child's pillowcase, and I start the dog from the tricycle, and the dog immediately zips right out behind the house, and there's a snowmobile sitting on blocks with a cover on it. Dog just jumps on that thing, is rototilling on that, and I'm looking at my dog going, dog, I need you to not play with snowmobiles right now. I need you to find this child, right? And the dog's jumping. She's all excited. Her tail's going. I'm going, what is wrong with you, dog? We're under a lot of pressure here. All these people are watching. I nearly need you to go find the child, not the snowmobile, right? So I humored the dog, right? I said, all right, so you're convincing me. You're trying to tell me there's no place for the child to be. Where is it going to be? I can see it's skin tight cover, right? And I, so I look under the track and I f pretend to feel around. And I literally, my dog will not leave the snowmobile, right? <coughs> I literally drag her off, kicking and screaming. And finally she looks at me and says, you want to go for a walk? Great, let's go for a walk. <laughs> She's all mad at me. And if you own a Labrador Retriever, you know what I'm talking about, a mad lab. They give you that sulk and turn their back to you. So... So here I am, now, it, it's, now I've got to be in the supervisor, I've got to start calling some resources and get some help on this thing. And So I'm on the phone and the radio and all of a sudden this little boy in footy pajamas comes around the corner of the house rubbing his eyes, soaking wet, drenched in sweat. And his mother sees him and she runs up and scoops him up and these words will burn in my brain forever because he goes, she goes, where have you been? He goes, I was sleeping in Daddy's snowmobile. He was curled up between the handlebars and the windshield. I had my hand on him as I was pretending to look. My poor dog is going, take the cover, I'll make you a hero right now. And I'm going, stupid dog, stupid dog, right? Trust your dog. Dogs are impartial, they don't, you know. And, and from there, as I trained other handlers, because I was, I was one of the trainers, um, I always instilled in them, even though it doesn't make sense, you've got to trust what your dog is telling you. And uh, they won't lead you astray. They only know what to do. They don't have emotions tied to it. So they're not going to lead you off the wrong, wrong track. So, and, uh, you know, you get humbled when you work with a dog. When you're training and handling a dog in the field, it's a very humbling thing because you will learn very quickly that your dog is so much smarter than you ever thought of being and that every time you think you're right, you're wrong. And uh, the other thing our labs are known for is the look. How many people here have labs and have gotten the look? Well, one day I was hopelessly stuck and I had a high lift jack. Those are those big jacks with the long handles. They're dangerous, great way to take your teeth out. And I was stuck and I was fighting with it. Long story made short, the handle ended up going flying, bounced off the bed of the truck, went right through the back window and stunk into the windshield. And my dog was sitting in the seat and she just kind of casually looked at me. <laughs> like, smooth move, dad. And I'd never forget that look, right? 
and she was cool and calm and you know and, and one of the things I didn't realize that you know having three kids at home that my kids had started this game where squirrels would end up at the bird feeder and they'd sick the dog on her right and you know it'd be this great scurry and they'd laugh and think it was great well I didn't know this was going on so one day I'm sitting on this pond watching fishermen and I look at my dog and she's just trembling, right? She's just like, all of a sudden something's wrong. I look at her, I go, what's wrong? And then I look at her, just off the end of her nose, there's a red squirrel leaning on his back, chewing on cones, right? Well, she had been primed to chase those things for days, not knowing. And I'm looking at her like she's just, her eyes are bugged out. And she's like, let me go, say the word, say the word, right? And then I realized, I went home and said, no more, no more sicking the dog on squirrels. We got on do that so but she was good she didn't break but uh, so but you know when you're working with canines it, it's it's a whole different experience you know you learn to rely on your partner and 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 literally they become a part of your everything you know and a lot of people ask me like you know what is the best breed and um, I gotta do my survey I didn't do my survey did I how many people here have the shepherd type dogs with pointy ears in the crowd? How many people have Labradors with the round ears that flop down? Oh good, I'm in good company, good. Because here's what would happen. We would get together in training. Part of the, part of the team at the time we had half uh, Dutch Shepherds, Malinois, and then we had the labs, right? And I was being one of the head trainers, I would kind of ride the people with the pointy eared dogs a little bit. And my theory was this, and they didn't agree with me, I don't know why, but, but you know, the shepherds have open ears, stick right out. And I say, rain gets in there and causes jungle rot, slows them down. <laughs> the labs are a little more advanced. They got a flap over their ear and they don't have to deal with that. Well, if you can imagine, we had quite a few heated discussions over lunch when we were training dogs. Well, one day, one of the handlers, she had a Dutch shepherd, a beautiful little Dutchie, and... Uh, it was a hot day. We were training in Millinocket, and, and uh, I needed water. I was very thirsty. I said, do you have any water, Michelle? She goes, oh, yeah, right here. And she handed me one of those big Coleman water coolers. I've got the little spout, but the big, the big top. So I took a big guzzle of that. About the third gulp, I realized that the last time I saw her with that, her dog had its head shoved right down inside that drinking water. <laughs> And when I pulled that down, she looked at me with the biggest grin. She goes, you're going to get pointy ears now. <laughs> right? And I said, I got duct tape and taped them down for a few days, got through it. But uh, so, you know, very, you know, it's a lot of fun, but it's a lot of hard work. It takes a lot of dedication to be a canine handler because unlike if I'm a diver, I dive and I put my equipment away, as a canine handler, I bring, you know, the dogs always come home and they'll puke or they'll pee or they'll do something or tear the house up or whatever. You know, you're on the, you're on the hook 24-7 when you have a dog because you don't just hang them up on the shelf and walk away, right? So, um, so you know, it's, it's, it requires a lot of commitment to be a dog handler. And, you know, on most of the calls, particularly search and rescue, you know, you're the first to come and the last to leave. Um, and case in point, I was involved with a search up in Caribou, Maine. We had a missing lady. Um, she was she was mentally challenged, and uh, she had when she had a compulsive disorder where she would have to walk to, to calm down. And she had a route that she would walk every day. And she was she had had some some thing, events happen that had her upset. And she went on her walk. She had, it was an established route, and she disappeared. She didn't ever come back. So, so hence the search began. And, um, you know, it, was, it ended up being a large search, you know. Um, so by the, you know, by the third day, you know, it was not looking good. We, hadn't, we didn't have a clue. We hadn't found anything. And uh, if you can imagine putting about 20 hours a day walking with your dog, how tired you're going to get, right? It, it's physically, both dog and man were wearing out. And we were kind of at the end of it for us. Usually when I manage searches and things, I would put two days, put a dog for two days, and then put them up for two days. 
because, you know, there's a certain line that they don't recover back from if you push them too far. And um, so this was beyond that, way beyond that. They asked me to do one more run, and I did. And then I did a search error, a block, and I came back. And uh, when I came back, I called the head court, the, the command post, and I said, look, there's one area I want to go check on my own, if that's all right. And the search had gone long by the area that I wanted to double check. You know, one of those gut feelings that you get. So they said, yeah, go ahead. And uh, so I went down, started searching, and, and it was an area, it was an old reclaimed dump, and very fertile because the burdock plants were up over my head. And if you know what burdock plants are, they get those lovely little porcupine eggs. And uh, so it was up high, unusually high, and it was on a slope. And uh, so I went down, I was look, walking around, all of a sudden my dog disappeared, and she came back with the big guys, and she ran right up to me and said, you know, in her language said, you gotta follow me right now. And I knew exactly that she had something. So we, I started following her, and pretty quick I see her go, and I see something white, I run over, and it's an old washing machine. Not so good. So, but she was. She came and got me again. She said, "Come on, keep going. You're slowing me down." So I went over and down this little thicket and into this thing. And and lo and behold, there was Goldie. Her name was Goldie Jordan. She was laying right on her back, arms stretched. I thought I didn't know. It didn't look well good at the moment. So I get to her and I shake her a little bit. I said, "Goldie, Goldie." And she pops right up, looks at me, sees the dog, pats the dog right on the head. <laughs> I go, do you want some water? And she says, yes. So I gave her some water. Now, you don't understand. This is now day four and of 20 hours a day. All of us were just physically exhausted. Everybody who had given everything we had. So I get on the radio, and I call. Hey, I got her. She's over here. Not. <laughs> I got her. She's over here. Help me. Get over here. <laughs> Started screaming on the radio. And... Uh, so everybody came running over, and I gotta say, it was probably one of the most fulfilling moments of my life to actually have saved her life and, and find her. And, and uh, you know, those are the victories that make it all worthwhile. All that, all that extra time and energy that you put into it. And uh, so she was, you know, that dog right there was phenomenal. And, and you know, in her career, she helped solve 12 homicide cases. $300,000 worth of fish and wildlife, and I can't tell you how many lives she's saved. So one little brown dog has a lot of power in those four feet. So, and, and if I thought it, she did it. You know, she was just one of those dogs, that, a one in a million dog that could almost read your mind. And, uh, and also give you that cue. Like, <laughs> wake up. Uh, so, but then as, you know, things progressed, one of the major cases that I ended up getting involved with was a Baxter Park case involving a cult group that buried babies, deceased babies in the park. And this was quite a, quite a, a thing. And um, worked on it for over a year. And, um, and, you know, my dog was the one that ended up locating the sites and solving the, solving the, the, the crime. And uh, we spent it was in the, the most remote part of Baxter, up by, up by Matagamon Lake and up in that whole region. Um, now, we had the, the main investigating office was uh, Massachusetts State Police and their detectives. Well, they came to Maine because they had, you know, the information. They came to Maine thinking Baxter Park was a city park. <laughs> And this is November. <laughs> so they're little penny loafers and fancy fancies and stuff, you know, their little trench coat and all that didn't kind of fit in with the motif of the park, right? So they get up there and the first day we, you know, we brief and we go out, well, um, you know, the, and we search. We started at, the, at what they call the Trout Brook Farm and, and there was a trail. It's a 26 mile trail and somewhere along that route is where they, they hid things. And, uh, so the first day we go around and they, their feet are getting a little cold and they're a little, little on the cold side and so forth. So they're, they're kind of thinking, oh, this isn't a city park, <laughs> right? Well, the next day we had to go by boat to the head end of Matagamon and the lake was frozen. It had about a half inch of ice. 
and we, you know, we'd put them in the boat, and we would drive the boat up on the ice and break a channel, right? And I looked over at their boat, and they're holding on to the gunnels, and they're just as white as snow, and they're like this. We never saw them again. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but they stayed in Bangor after that. <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah, it was, they were definitely out of their league as far as the gear that they had to do the work, so. But, uh, and that was such a remote area that we had to fly in with helicopters, get dropped off and do sections of trails and then get picked up. And, and if you've ever landed in a Huey helicopter in a little alder run where you could actually see trees less than a foot away from the rotor of the helicopter as you're landing, it's quite an experience. <laughs> Just saying. It's almost as bad as being in a boat breaking ice for those guys. But... Uh, but, you know, and, and we ended up solving the case uh, about it the next year, the, in the next fall, spring, we were able to get enough information and I got to interview one of the, one of the people involved and he gave us what we needed to, 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 to pinpoint the location and, and make the recovery. So, so, but you got to love Maine, right? Maine people are the best, right? So at the end of this thing, we had, a, we had a gathering in Millinock at, at, at this restaurant, and, and uh, the lady who owns and ran the restaurant was very gracious to open her doors to a whole giant crew and after hours and so forth. And, and one of the prosecuting people from Mass kind of thought it was a big deal in his mind. Um, and he got up, and he was giving us, you know, all these lectures of, patting us on the back and and the lady who opened the place she was trying to pick up some stuff and, and he kind of snarled at her a little bit you know and was like oh you shouldn't have done that <laughs> right <laughs> and I'm married to I'm French and my wife has French in her as well so you never make you never get a little French girl mad at you <laughs> never never <laughs> so anyway this whole thing progressed and and finally at the end she shows up uh, you know, everything's kind of settled down, we're getting ready to leave, and she comes up with this little horn, this little flute thing, and she goes, my husband makes the best moose calls in the world. She goes, really? He bit, <laughs> hook, line, and sinker. She goes, yes. She goes, have you ever heard a moose call? He goes, no, no. So she goes, you hold that, see this piece? You blow in that, and, and you will hear the most beautiful moose call you ever heard. So he does. <laughs> And the, the horn goes around in the circle, and the end of it is pointed right at your face. And when he blows, he gets a face full of flour. Poof! <laughs> right? <laughs> and all of us in the room, we fell out of our chairs laughing, right? <laughs> oh, it was such a priceless moment. But. And she just walked off into the kitchen. Justice has been served. So, uh, um, but... Uh, you know, I've been involved in some very unique, unique cases, and uh, you know, but I'll, I'll jump jump across from the dog thing to a few of my my warden tales. How are we doing for time? We good? I tend to ramble. All good? You're fine. Okay. So, so here we are up near Cocajo. Has anybody here been to Cocajo, Maine? Population not many. <laughs> well. We were up there working the decoy deer, the rubber deer, and sitting on the side of the road. It was a foggy, misty night, and we're standing there, and we kept seeing this, this beam of light sweeping the skyline. And you know, on a foggy night, it catches the light, so you can, you know, you'll see it sweep the skyline. We're going, somebody's hunting. It was November. Somebody's hunting nearby, right? So, so pretty quick we go out, we got to find that. So we knock our, our dummy deer down and we go walking. We're trying to walk up the road, trying to figure out where this light, because it had to be close by. Well, there's a little side road. We walk down that, and lo and behold, there's a camper tucked in there. And we, we kind of sneak up, as game wardens do, a kind of sneaky group, and kind of sneak up and we can hear walking in the camper. And it sounded like a couple of, you know, young boys and their dads. Nothing serious. So, so sitting there for a minute and all of a sudden the young fella comes out, that's about his age, comes out with a big spotlight and starts lighting the clear cut. Well you can't do that, especially during deer season, that's a big no-no, right? 
and he's lighting it, and Dad comes out, and he's got to go to the bathroom, and he's got his little small light, and he's pointing it, and, he, and as he gets near the son who's lighting the clear cut, he goes, game warden's going to get you, boy. <laughs> I was literally six feet away, right? I figured that was my cue to enter. So I kick my light on, I go, game warden, how's it going tonight? And they just froze. <laughs> froze, solid, right? So they're frozen in time. And I walk up, and I take the flashlight out of the little boy's hand, and I take the one from the dad's hand, and I go, let me guess, you're here hunting, right? Just a nod. I go, and you have guns in your camper, right? Nod. I go, you realize that using this big light, looking around here is $1,000 and three days in jail and loss of your guns, right? Nod. <laughs> I go, so here's what we're going to do. I go, when we have to go pee, we're going to take the little flashlight and we're going to point it at the ground and we're going to keep this big light and we're going to use it when, on your way home when you have a flat tire to light up changing your tire. But we're not going to light the clear cut anymore. Am I, am I good with that? <laughs> nod, nod, <laughs> nod, right? So, so I look at, and uh, so we walk off into the darkness. And, and as game wardens, you learn we're very good at walking in the dark without lights, right? That's what we do. And so we just drift off into nowhere, and this little voice goes, have a nice night. <laughs> and, 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 we, and we drifted off. I suspect it never happened again. I don't know, but so, uh, but, you know, you have a lot, there's a lot of funny things that happen. And, and uh, you know, the other thing that, that as a game warden's nemesis is skunks. Raccoons and skunks, but skunks are really bad, right? So we get a call, another lady, damsel in distress up the road. And we get up there, my partner and I, we get up there. This was in Greenville, and this lady, we talked to her at the door, and she goes, something's eating all my cat's food. And she would feed her cats on the porch, and there was an open porch. She goes, something keeps eating the cat food. And she goes, I think it's living underneath. And she pointed to this big hutch that kind of had, had, you know, the... The opening at the bottom. I go, oh, I'll save you, ma'am. So, <laughs> so I get a stick, a broom, and I'm kind of pulling it underneath there, and a couple cans roll out, and so on. All of a sudden, I can't move the stick, and I can't pull it back out. And it's like something's holding on to the end of this thing, right? So I'm pulling and pulling and pulling, and all of a sudden, I pull it to a point where I see these two little feet holding on to it. And I recognize exactly what kind of animal has those two little feet. Unfortunately, it was too late. <laughs> I got sc boof. We both, my partner and I, we both got it. I mean, head on. She ran in the house, poor woman. We just sprayed her porch. <laughs> and uh, so we, you know, if you've ever gotten sprayed directly in the face, it burns a little bit. So, so we deal with the situation. Now I got to go home. And we lived on Main Street. She meets me at the door. She goes, you're not coming in here. <laughs> I had to change in my, I had to dump every ounce of clothes on the porch before she'd let me in the house. And uh, right on Main Street. So it was a, a humbling experience. But uh, yeah, skunks always, uh, yeah, it was dark. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the streaking game warden. <laughs> so, uh, you know, things that happen. And, and, uh, but it's a definitely a unique field of work to get into. And, and you get a front row seat of good to bad. And, and one of the things that, that when we wrote the book was initially we were going to talk just about dog things. But, but having gone through some serious, difficult things like dealing with, I went to New Orleans for five weeks after Hurricane Katrina, did body recovery work there. And uh, you don't walk away from that not being changed, the things that we saw and the things that we had to deal with. Um, so, you know, I was very ill when I came back from New Orleans for a host of reasons. And, um, and I ended up with a very bad case of PTSD. And uh, for those of people that think that's just in your head, I'm going to tell you when you're on the floor doing tremors and you have a migraine for three months without a break, um, you realize it's a little more than just in your head. And, uh, you know, fortunately I had great resources back on my feet, but it changed my life forever. I have, you know, there's things I can deal with and things I can't. I don't have that ability to just, 
just eat stress like I used to, that's for sure. So, uh, did I miss anything, dear? I'll open the, the floor to questions. Yes? In the uh, talk was prefaced by you saying some hikers. Yes. Hikers. Yes. Would you be able to give an example? Or sure, sure. Um, yeah, definitely. The, one of the, the biggest incidents that I had, I, I, I had the Appalachian Trail running through my patrol, my district. So I was on the AT all the time rescuing people with broken legs, dislocated everything, or very sick. Um, but this case, in, in reference to the hikers, we had two skiers. If you're anybody familiar with Gulf Hagus, it's, it's called the Grand Canyon of Maine. It's just, it's just outside of Brownville. Um, very, very dangerous place if you're not prepared for what you're in. And I had two skiers, a man and husband and wife, left Little Lyford Pond and skied down the gorge. Okay, that is boiling white water, waterfalls, but we'd had a lot of snow and it literally covered, covered everything. And they thought it was like a trail that they could go right down, right? Well, they didn't, they got down about halfway down through there and went through the ice obviously it wasn't even ice it was snow and they fell through and that and uh, we got the call that they were missing from the camps at about seven o'clock in the evening and we headed up we took their tracks found their tracks and we started but we realized we couldn't follow them we knew not to go down that gorge was well, there's point points along the way that it's 150 feet straight down when you're on the top and they were running the bottom so so what we and the snow is so deep that you couldn't go to the edge and look because it would cause an avalanche and take you with it so we had to tie ourselves off and run down so we could look in to see if their tracks were still there this went on all night and 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 if you can imagine snowshoeing in, in you know deep, deep powder snow, the toilet takes on you and you get soaking wet because you're working so hard. And uh, so we kept going and going and going. And um, finally we found a spot where they'd come out and then we stayed on their track and, and we find them at about, I don't know, one or two in the morning. We found them, they're soaking wet. There was dead of winter. They were severe hypothermia. You know, it was about as bad a scenario as you can get. The problem we had was, um, so were we, because <laughs> we were so wet. And uh, so, you know, when we got to them, our only option was to make a fire, get a good fire going, try to warm them up and get other resources to come to us and break a trail to come in the other way. So, because they couldn't walk anymore, especially the husband, he was the worst. And um, so we got a fire going and we warmed them up and uh, waited for about two and a half hours and they came in another route and they packed everything down and and uh, we were able to walk them to snowmobiles and get them out. Long night. I got home at about seven o'clock the next morning and and uh, you know I made the mistake I said I'm gonna get in a tub of hot water just you know well I did that my calves twisted right around and I come flying out of there screaming <clears throat> so don't do that again <laughs> so but uh, that was one of the big rescues. Um, I probably airlifted, oh, probably two dozen people off the Appalachian Trail in my career. Um, and uh, one thing you never forget is the look on the victim's face when you clip the clip and they start heading up to the helicopter and the thing starts spinning, right? They always have eyes about this big. And I don't blame them, I would too. But, but you know, you go click and they go, Boom, up they go, and yeah, it's kind of scary for everybody involved. But, uh, um, but yeah, we would have, you know, one of the things I dealt with constantly on the Appalachian Trail was it was, it was solid wilderness. We were part of the 100-mile wilderness, and, and prior to that, you know, the family members would be in contact with the hikers, and all of a sudden they'd hit that, and you can't, get, you can't call out. There's nothing, you know, and then they would panic and, and so <laughs> forth, and we would get calls and so forth. But... We could do pretty good hitting different points of the trail, and we could usually come up with them within a, without too much trouble. But, but illness and broken bones were an, almost an everyday, to the point where I carried a pair of crutches in my truck because I learned 
carrying people is not fun because they <laughs> ride over the trail, right? Here's the trail, and you're over here because the, the, you're on the edges of where you're over the rocks and all the... It's very brutal, but it's a lot easier to hand them a pair. They got a busted ankle. You hand them, you hand them a pair of crutches and say, "Go slow. I'll be right behind you." <laughs> That's the way to go. So, any more questions? Yes. Yes, very much so. I had a situation where a young man from Greenville got lost on Moosehead Lake in a blizzard. And he was coming from Rockwood to Greenville, got lost in a whiteout snowstorm right early evening and called his mom on the phone and said, I'm lost. I don't know where I am. I can't see. And she said, stay right there. I'll call the game warden. He, when he hung up from her, his snowmobile dropped through the ice into open water. He was actually sitting on the edge of open water and he went right through. And, um, and he... To add to the challenge, he had a he had an artificial leg, and uh, which made it hard to harder to get out of the out of the hole. He was able to get up. And now he's in pitch black, total whiteout. He's soaking wet. This is not a good scenario. And uh, um, all of a sudden, he sees a blinking light. Well, right where he went through the ice is the only place where there's a camp and that gentleman had a, had a grader and he would grade the road to Spencer Bay and he was just coming back from plowing snow and, the, and he saw that. So he started yelling and when he did, the gentleman answered, grabbed the light and tried to go find him on the lake. And uh, when he did, the, the, the young fella saw the light, ran towards it, fell in again and he was able to get him out and then get him out and then get him into the house and get him, strip him down and get some warm clothes on him. And uh, when I picked him up, I, I could, it, you couldn't even drive there. It was, it was so snowing, so hard, you couldn't see. I finally got him, called his mom, said he was all set, good. And I told him, I said, you know what? Two things I would do if I were you. I said, I'd be in church Sunday morning and I'd buy a lottery ticket because you <laughs> fell in the only hole where somebody, somebody lived. I said, you're a very fortunate young man. So... Uh, but uh, any more? Mike, yes. Have you ever done any case with your dog and accidentally stumbled onto another case? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that is, I'll deal with that later. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it does, you know. And uh, usually it's a case of a whole different context, nothing to do with what you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, that would happen, you know, quite often. Yes. Well, this is a classic case of, of, this is my humble opinion, okay? Nobody else's, but she had all the tools to do it, but she did not have the experience and the knowledge to, to know, to do it. And that's, that's the, the, the problem we see today with people that jump into the big woods. They've seen it on TV, they've watched Survivor, they've watched things, they've never physically done it. And, and they don't have that actual skill, and uh, that's when they get themselves in huge trouble, you know, and uh, yes? Did you ever go looking for the hermit? No, I was not involved with that. I, I ne never was. No, no, I didn't. Um, so, yes? What was the story on that lady that got lost on the Appalachian Trail and uh, wanted to look for her for her? Yeah, that's who he was talking about. Yep, yep. How come he didn't find her with dogs? Well, I'll tell you why. It all matters which way the wind blows. Do they smell the air or do they smell the ground? Both. But what happened, um, that particular area where she was is there's what they call a seer school. And it's a, it's a designated block of land that the uh, military uses to train pilots for if they get shot down in hostile territory. And um, so it has lots of regulations and lots of things you don't just go wandering in there because they actually do what they do there is unreal so but it was searched um, there was a dog team that had been literally probably 200 feet from where she had been but from experience it all matters which way the wind blows if the wind's blowing counter to the dogs being able to pick it up it's just like smelling a campfire if the wind's blowing the right way you smell it 
if you're in the wrong upwind of it, you're not going to smell it. And that's exactly kind of what happened in that case. So, um, yes? Did you know a lot of that dog when you started? Did you train? How did you know about training? I had dogs growing up. Um, and um, I didn't have a clue, to be honest with you, to train dogs to do what I wanted in, in this kind of thing. I, was, I had started training, and I was very fortunate that there was a retired state trooper who was a canine handler that lived in Greenville at the time, and uh, he was more than willing to work with me and help me and teach me the ropes, so I did it the right way. And uh, that's kind of how I got started. So I do, I do. You know, my number one, I've trained dogs explosives, narcotics, bed bugs, I've done it all. And, and right now I'm training bed bug dogs and shed dogs, dogs to find moose and deer antlers, mostly in the private sector. So um, I have trained dogs to do all kinds of things, but uh, right now the, the demand is bed bugs. Dogs are phenomenal at finding bed bugs. It's incredible because the bugs release a pheromone when they smell warm blooded animals and uh, that's what the dogs learned that you imprint that and uh, you know I can I can clear we were doing dorm rooms in Boston at the colleges and uh, I could clear a dorm room in three minutes it would take two men an entire day to do that same room and have less accuracy than the dog so it's just amazing yes um, primarily we use, you know, in, in the law enforcement realm, for example, we use, we use uh, shepherds, the shepherd breeds the, uh, in, in labs just because of their, their, their temperaments go really good for being trained in those disciplines. But I'm a, I've seen dogs of all sizes and, and capable of doing it. What I say is, is you know, my... My feeling on it, it's, it's the relationship between the dog and the handler that matters, nothing else. I've seen dogs not be compatible to their, to their handlers and everything goes sideways. But if you have a dog and the handler that have confidence in each other, you'll have a great team. But if you don't have that, you're not going anywhere. And so. I have a Yorkie and of course she's the smartest dog. They're brilliant world. dogs. Yep. Because they're very smart. And yep. They can teach them to, to transport things. From yep. One group sure. To sure. And, um, that's yeah. Why I was just curious. Yeah. No. It, it, the, I know I the challenge with smart dogs, I'm going to say this right now, is they're smarter than you. Yeah. And it's a problem because very quickly you're being trained. <laughs> very quickly you're the trainee and they're the trainer. And uh, it can be quite a challenge with some of these brilliant dogs. And. Uh, and I've dealt with quite a few of them, but uh, you know, overall, like like for example, they use a lot of beagles for uh, bed bug work, you know, and things. I personally like my labs. I'm a partial to labs, but when like for example, when we were doing bed bug work in dorms and things, you needed a bigger dog to smell the top bunk because the beagles are kind of low. <laughs> you had to, you know, if, so so and and bed. Dogs love the bed bug thing because they get to jump on beds all day, right? It's <laughs> heaven for them, right? They think it's the best. So, so uh, any more? Yes? How do, you, how do you treat bed bugs? Like, how do you get them? Like, do you search for dogs that go get them? Or? No, I don't touch them. My dog, my dog says, hey, man, you got bed bugs over here. And we all go, there and we walk away. <laughs> we don't deal with them. We just tell them where they are. That's a beautiful thing working a dog. So, so we don't actually mess with them. We just tell you, yeah, you got some here and here and here and, and uh, so um, and. Uh, of course, when you train a dog for something, you have to have something to train it with. It took me three years to convince her that these special vials that I get with bed bugs that they could not escape. <laughs> took me three years to convince her so yeah so yes Are, uh, puppies assessed when they're young? absolutely we start you know we start looking at the dog's abilities when they're about five weeks old through to eight weeks old and uh, 
we're doing a lot of assessments to see if they have the right things. You know, one of the things we're looking for, we're looking for confidence, new environments, what, how they handle shiny floors or, or the inside of a boat or, or environments that they're not accustomed. Some dogs will just lock up and drop and others are just going to say, hey, happy day, let's go. And that's what we're looking for. And we're looking for that drive, right? So, and explain drive a little bit. There are two elements to drive, okay? If I have a shepherd here and a Labrador retriever here, if I throw a ball, the shepherd's going to get the ball to kill it, okay? No and ifs or buts. Go kill that thing because that's what it wants to do. And it's going to bring it back to me so it can do it again. The lab and I throw the ball, right? It just wants to do that till your arms and legs fall off, right? Their, their joy is the retrieved. The, the shepherds is, the only reason they're bringing it back to you is because they want to get it again. They want to catch it again, right? Two totally different motivations. So when we're training the breeds, we have to, we have to use different techniques for each, each breed because they have this thing where shepherds, for example, you know, if you throw a ball and they bring it to you, the first thing these, these big, the, the shepherd breeds are going to do is pop the tennis ball. Because they, they like to bite things. That's what makes them happy. And especially these Belgian Malinois that all the law enforcement ages, agencies are using today. Here's the thing about them. They bite when they're happy. They bite when they're sad. They bite when they're confused. And they bite when they're just plain old, don't know what else to do. That's what they do. They bite. That's inheriting what they love to do. If you own a, a, a Belgian Malinois, you're going to get bit. You, it's just going to be. It's going to be a love bite, but they're going to bite you. And... Uh, so when you have the shepherds, like they like tugs, for example, you know, they'll retrieve you something and they want to play wrestle with it a lot more. Labs are just going to drop it and say, hey, let's throw it again, throw it again, throw it again, throw it again. Two totally different motivators. So, yes. Lamb, go ahead. Uh, you always like to go swimming. How do you break them in that habit? Well, you don't. <laughs> it's impossible. Here's the factor with, with Labradors and water. It's best if it's black muck. Skitter trail black muck, that's what makes a Labrador happy. They slide on their bellies and they roll and they come out of there looking like a mud ball. Yeah, you can't. They love, that's their natural instinct. But one of the things I found, that the, one of the reasons I really like labs to do track work is if I went by water, the labs would instantly get in the water and cool off and then get back on the job, which was a huge advantage because one of the problems when you're working tracking dogs is getting them overheated because once they do, they lose their ability to scent. So by having, by having the dogs love water, they'd see a puddle and they'd slide right through and get up and go and they'd cool themselves down. So it was in warm weather, it was really, you know, an advantage. So I'll take one more question. I think we're good. This young fellow right here, he's got to have one more question. I can see it in his eyes. It's just rolling around. <laughs> well, all right. Well, thank you very much. Yes? Yeah, get about Dash. Remember him? Yes. Somebody was telling me that when he was making those TV programs that they put a whole bunch of fish upstream and net them off, and then when he was fishing, they let them go. And that would make for a good day's fishing, right? That's how they made them. I never, I never saw that, but no, nothing I saw. Right, right. I don't, I don't, I never heard of anything like that, but I can't say. So, all right, well, yes. So, as a game warden, what kind of like work shift? Like, you didn't have a typical 7 to 3 30. Right. Always on call? Yes. You're on call 24 7. Um, you are, well, your days off were. You know, when you had a day off, you were off. They would only call you in a real emergency. But when you're the dog guy, that's quite often. And here's the deal. It's your daughter's birthday, and you're planning a, a, a celebration, you're, and, you know, you get the call as a missing three-year-old in Millinocket. What are you going to do? So, you know, you give a lot. You do. You give, game wardens give a lot of their time. And, and we kind of had a system where, I'm on camera, so. You had a system where, where you know, you were kind of expected to work from, you know, A to Z, 
and and if you had to extend that, you'd call your supervisor, and they'd let you let you work beyond and so forth. It was very flexible, had to be, and you and it changes with the season, right? So. So in the fall you're working a lot of nights, in the spring you're working smelts and turkeys, so there's a lot of, a lot of different components to it. It has to be flexible, so it's not an eight to five thing at all, so. All right, oh yes. Thank you for your service. Oh, thank you, thank you. We're going to be here with some books, and, and if you have any questions or anything, we're going to be right here for a little bit. So thank you very much for having me. This is kind of what they're catching right